This question is from Prabhu. Namaskaram Sadhguru. Yesterday you spoke about deities as tools. In my experience, all the tools I use, they enhance the function of one of my sense organs. I can't perceive anything outside of the five sense organs. So how can I utilize a tool like a deity, which supposedly enhances my perception on a dimension that I cannot even perceive right now? No, no, first you enhance the existing perception, wear spectacles, you'll see better, you know. Yes, just a small lens, an invisible lens, a contact lens if you wear, suddenly the world becomes clear, you know. That's all it takes. Now, you do not approach a deity in terms of, I want to access this, I want to access that. There are certain type of people who do that. That's not the way to go. The simple thing is, if the deity is properly consecrated, when I say properly, each one of them is consecrated normally for a specific purpose. Now we have a Dhyanalinga. It is for meditativeness. You don't cry there, go there and cry, Dhyanalinga, uh, my financial situation not working out, please, that guy just sits like this. Because he doesn't know what is financial situation, he doesn't care. <laughs> because he doesn't eat, he doesn't do anything. What does financial situation mean to him? Then you go to Devi, you know. <laughs> There you can cry, because she needs these things, she understands that part. Like this, different things are made for different purposes. All that might have gotten gobbled in the culture today, people think temple is a temple, it's not like that. Well, <laughs> I've been trying to explain this about certain temples about which there are controversies. Some of the men here are protesting, why can't we be Devi, you know, Bhairaganas? <laughs> only why women are in charge of the temple, why is it only their privilege, gender discrimination? That's how it is, because she's consecrated that way. It needs women, she needs women around her. She needs that and that's the way it is done, for a specific purpose. So, if it is well consecrated for a specific purpose, consecrations are of different kinds. There are some consecrations which just reverberate. They have no discrimination. Like, well you have uh, these lingas in the Surya Kund, they have no discrimination, they just reverberate. They've been set up for a masculine energy, they simply reverberate. Whoever comes, they don't know. Even if you put uh, a buffalo into the pond, they won't know, they will do the same thing. Because they just… it's like light. Light is on, you can read, you can write, you can see, you can do whatever the hell you want. It doesn't care, it just puts out light, that's all. So, they are that type of consecration where is, there is no discrimination or any kind of discernment in that. But Dhyanalinga, Devi, these are made differently where there is a discernment. It's not that when I… if I say this, uh, this could be taken literally, if you enter the temple, the deity knows who you are. Who you are means not your name, your father's name, we don't care. Even I have not asked what's your father's name. When I wanted to marry my wife, I didn't ask her what is your father's name. My father was shocked that you don't know her father's name and you're marrying this girl. I said, I'm just marrying the girl <laughs> So, uh, there are certain people who wants to know father's name, how much wealth he has, what is his financial status and social status because they're marrying something else. So, this aspect of the deity able to recognize you has been done in many ways. This is done in a, 
a very refined, sophisticated way so that it recognizes anybody based on how their energy situations are, where the status of life is right now, what level of evolution, how it is in that sense. But there are other deities which is very common in southern India which is probably uh, these days lost in north is we have Kula Devatas or Kula Daivams. That means a particular deity created for a particular Kula. Kula means a smaller segment of a caste. So here the genetic map of this Kula is kept and the deity is consecrated to serve only that type of genetics. This is why this fight in the villages, any inter-kula uh, marriage or inter-caste marriage means why they're struggling is, then you won't have a god of your own. You will become outcast. Well, that's taken on a social dimension and an ugly forms, that's a different matter. But essentially it is coming from this fundamental understanding because you have created an energy form which takes care of this particular genetic uh, information. If somebody who doesn't belong to that comes, it won't respond. So these things were done in a very scientific way for different purposes. There are many uh, fantastic processes even today, but mostly lost. So it is better to create universal things which are not based on genetics but based on the evolution of one's energy. That is what we are doing. That is why these new temples which will not recognize you by genetics, it will not like recognize you by your parentage but will recognize you for what you are right now. So both these things were done right from ancient times but most of the temples were done for genetic material because that is what people would fund. They want a specific temple in their town for their clan, so that their well-being, they created those things. A few were created for everybody's well-being, so they were always named differently to... to make you understand a little bit. Here, uh, let us say there is one Mariaman temple, it will have a prefix name of a particular kula and then that. But let's say some other temple like let's say Kashi Vishwanath, it's Vishwanath. That means he's for the entire world. He is not recognizing you by your genetics. He is recognizing you by who you are right now in terms of your energy, in terms of your evolution, where you are right now. In that context, Dhyanalinga will not recognize your genetics. He doesn't care whether you came from your mother's womb or dropped from heaven. We don't care because we don't think coming out of your mother's womb and dropping from heaven, one is superior to the other. It doesn't matter how you came, how are you right now, that's all that matters. So, this is a different dimension of consecration. So, when we talk about deities and about you enhancing your perception, you don't go there to enhance your perception. There is a process, what to do? You just do that process, you may get enhanced. Oh, so it is iffy, is it? It is not iffy, it depends on where you are, accordingly it will enhance you. If you get enhanced for what you are not ready, you will go crazy, believe me, you lose your mind. If you saw the things that I saw when I was very young, I'm telling you, you would have lost your mind, many of you. Because I saw all kinds of things and sat there like this. And even people around me thought I have some psychiatric issue because I sat seeing all kinds of impossible things. So if you develop a perception to see something which your f mental framework and your energy framework is not ready for, you will be shattered. So you never go seeking a particular level of perception. You just go do the process. The deity is being created in such a way, it is of a higher intelligence than you. You allow it to work with you. You just do your sadhana as it is prescribed. This is the excess, this is the code. Just make use of it 
And how much excess you find, let's see. Depends on who you are. <laughs>